Welcome to this presentation on Norse mythology. It's really just an introduction, and it's divided into three parts. Uh, this first one is going to focus on cosmology. So the three different presentations map across three different topics here. This first one on the mythic landscape focuses on cosmology. Uh, the next one will be on the gods and goddesses, uh, what makes a god a god, and what makes... Um, how are they actually uh, deployed and described in the literature? And then our third one is going to focus on the cult of the gods in Norse culture, which is going to look at evidence for the veneration of the gods, how they play out in the literature, and what that means historically, and all that kind of a business. Keep in mind that these presentations are very introductory. The goal here is not to give a complete description uh, or to, you know, um, make you an expert on the gods and the goddesses or Norse myth at all, but rather to give you a few, um, a few different ways to read the literature. So the presumption here is that you're going to go from these presentations, you're going to read the literature, and then the literature will make a bit more sense. You'll be able to sort of get under the hood of the literature and see what makes it tick. That, that's our goal here. So what I'd like to start off doing is run through a little bit about Old Norse literature, which runs from about 800 or so to about 1400. Old Norse is a linguistic term, and it describes the language that was used during this period. Now, you can't, it's not like they started speaking Old Norse in 800 and they stopped speaking it in 1400. There's a lot of changes that go on inside this period, and there's a lot of... Um, there's, there's a lot of sort of vague movement at the beginning of the period and the end of the period, but as in general, our, our literature comes from this period, from 800 to 1400. And we divide it up usually in several different ways. The first, uh, the first division, and the one that concerns us the most, is the mythological corpus. Uh, these, these consist of Viking poetry and Snorri's Eddas. Now, the Viking poetry that we get is actually recorded in later Christian sources, so it's not like you're reading you know, Viking poems written down by Vikings who are following the old pre-Christian religion. Instead, what you're getting are records of earlier poems being written down much later by Christians who, for whatever reason, consider them worthy of preserving. So we don't know how much they've actually changed from the, from the time of their composition to when they're actually recorded. That, that's a problem that scholars really get into and struggle with. So there's nothing really transparent about this literature at all. You always have to beware. It's a strange, dark, and terrifying world that you're getting into. And let the, um, let the unwary traveler beware. The next uh, section, the next category of literature that we have are the Fornalda Saga, uh, the legendary sagas, and there's about 28 of them. <clears throat> and they deal with uh, the old heroes, the gods, and the um, all these sort of figures from back in the day. So the, the saga, the Volsungs, the Volsunga saga, um, you look at um, a lot of these, you know, Sigurds and all this whole crew. These guys are the subject of the legendary sagas. This is when you have people actually interacting openly with the gods. So our next section then is the Kuninga Sogar, the King Sagas, and these are more historical in nature. They deal with actual real figures that we genuinely believe uh, existed in history. There's about 29 of them, and they deal with figures in both Scandinavia and Denmark. Now, the King Sagas, even though these are historical figures, you can't separate this from mythology because uh, many of these figures... Um, the stories are being written down hundreds of years after they actually lived. The saga that involves Harald Fairhair, for example, the first king of Norway, uh, this was written down almost uh, 400 years after he lived. So there are a lot of embellishments, there's a lot of mythology involved in it, and there's a lot of impact from other stories around the continent. For example, when when his saga was being written, chivalric literature was all the rage all over the place, and it was just as popular up in um, up in the Norse world. So you actually have sort of knightly ideals, chivalric ideals, 
uh, impacting the composition of these various different sagas, just as you still have old pre-Christian notions influencing these sagas as well. So again, you have to read these sagas with a very careful, careful um, approach. Now another um, another collection of sagas that we have are the sagas of the Icelanders. There's about 43 of these, and what happened was in the throughout the the um, uh, 9th and 10th centuries, you have the colonization of Iceland by Vikings, and the families that colonized Iceland. They developed their own stories about their families, independent traditions, and then over the course of uh, you know, 100, 200 years, these stories were collected together, and then eventually they were written down, each individual story being sort of knitted together into a, a long, cohesive story. These became the sagas. And the sagas of the Icelanders specifically relate to the actual people that were in Iceland. Now again, just like the king sagas, there are a lot of old pre-Christian mythological ideas that inform these, so you can't take them just as straight-up history as some have tried to do in the past. So you have to read them very, very cautiously, but they're very valuable for looking at the history of the period. And finally, we have the Ridra Sogar, the Knights Sagas. Now, the Knights Sagas are written as express imitations of the chivalric literature that's coming up from the South in the 13th century. There's about 32 original compositions, and there are 19 translations of uh, southerly compositions that then they're translating into Old Norse. So what we have here in, the, in Old Norse literature is we have everything ranging from the, this early, very early uh, Viking material that communicates a lot of these early mythological ideas, and then down through early legends, uh, historical sagas, with a greater or lesser degree of, of historical accuracy, and then finally chivalric ideas that are uh, being imported from the South. So there's a, a wide range of literature in here. So we're not going to be covering all of this stuff. What we're mostly interested in is what we can define as distinctively Norse. So we're going to be looking at what we get from that mythological corpus. Now, when we look at the mythological corpus, you can see that Snorri's Eddas uh, play a major part of it, so let's talk a little bit about that. Snorri Sturluson was a spy, a diplomat, a soldier, who traveled extensively in the Norse world and beyond, and uh, in the early half of the 13th century, he wrote a, a manual, um, a poetic manual, a manual of how to read and write poetry. And the reason why he did this was because by the early 13th century, Christianity had taken root so firmly that a lot of people were forgetting the old stories, they were forgetting a lot of the old uh, a lot of the old poetic conventions. And so rather than allow this stuff to be completely lost, Snorri decided to write this write this sort of manual on, on how to read and write poetry in the old style. Nowadays, it's called the Prose or Younger Edda to distinguish it from the poetic or older Edda that actually comes more directly from the Viking period. But he cites much of the poetic Edda. In some instances, we we get um, the po certain passages from the poetic Edda only from Snorri Sturluson. So it's not like they're they're ex they are mutually exclusive. It's a very porous boundary. Snorri is looking back to the Poetic Edda, he's using the Poetic Edda, and so much of our view of the Poetic Edda then comes from Snorri Sturluson. Now his, the way he wrote this down is he divided it into three separate sections. The first, Gilfeginning, deals directly with mythology, the stories itself. Skoldskapermal actually deals with poetic diction, while Haltetal uh, enumerates the different meters and what uh, defines each poetic meter. Now, what we're mostly concerned with here is Gilfeginning. Gilfeginning literally means the deceiving of uh, Gilfi. Now, Gilfi, we're told, is a king who wants to know about the gods, know about the old stories. And what he decides to do is he decides to go on a journey. And when he goes on this journey, he encounters uh, three figures whom we're told are high, equally high, and most high. And in asking them questions about the gods, he receives this uh, body of information. And, he, and then, of course, at the end, it's revealed that uh, he's actually talking to Odin. So Gilfeginning uh, starts with creation. It goes through all these mythological stories, and it goes right the way down to 
uh, the to Ragnarok, the Twilight of the Gods, when the whole world is going to get burned by the fire of Muspelheimer and uh, be sort of translated, the, the good parts are going to be translated into sort of a divine otherworld. There's a lot of indication that he's basing this largely on the Bible, and certainly his diction looks like biblical diction in a number of different places. Odin, we're told, uh, who is known as the All-Father, he, he governs um, he governs all the uh, actions of the world. He created the world, and he thus inherits many of the different attributes of the Christian world. So that pretty much covers our background material to the, uh, to the mythic landscape. So this is where we get much of our information from. All right, so let's talk about cosmology. What is cosmology? Cosmology is the study of the cosmos. And what does cosmos mean? It comes from a Greek term meaning order or the world. But when we look at the idea of cosmos, there's a number of different ways we can take it. When most people take the idea of cosmos, they think of it as the universe. But it's more than just the universe. It is the idea of the universe. And when you take it as the idea of the universe, cosmos becomes the way that we organize our experience. In other words, when we look at, the, when we look at a sunrise, rather than looking at it and thinking that the sun, we, we still say that the sun comes up. But of course, in our brains, what we're looking at is we, we reconstruct it where the world, the earth is turning, and so we are changing our perception of the sun, and the sun is at the center of our solar system, and the earth goes around it. We explain our experience through the idea of cosmos. So our, when we talk about cosmology in culture, what we're talking about is how people organize their experience, birth, life and death, the story of one's life. That's just as much a part of cosmology as is the whether you're dealing with a, um, a heliocentric model or a uh, geocentric model. Is the Earth at the center of the universe? Is the Sun at the center of the universe? What's at the center of the universe? Do you have a Big Bang that starts everything, or does God create everything? This is all cosmology because these are ideas that shape how we understand the events that happen to us. So cosmology is really that which informs our experience. And it's, it's very important to be aware of how we approach these different mythologies like Norse mythology because a lot of times how we interpret the myths impacts, how we interpret the myths impacts how we construct our perception of their cosmology. Let me give you an example of this. This is a modern depiction of the Norse cosmos. So you have this tree in the middle called Yggdrasil. Uh, you can see that there's this sort of uh, hall that's up on the top called Alsgarth. And then if you go down, you can see Alfheim. Uh, you can see then in this middle area, there's the Midgarth. And of course, this is where people live. And then down at the bottom where you have these roots, you can see starting at the left, Vanaheim, Jotunheim, uh, Niflheim, Hel, and Svartalfheim. And then, there, of course, there's this serpent that's sneaking around. This is all drawn from Snorri Sturluson's account in the Prose Edda. But what I want you to notice about this is that it's a very pretty, very structural picture like you might see in a comic book. What the artist has done is taken Snorri's stories and how he talks about these things. There's no actual picture of this. This is a modern need to put this into visual form. And what the artist has done is uh, he or she has taken the actual stories that Snorri is telling, and then has created an object that we can look at, something that we are looking at from the outside, objectified this object in such a way. Now, we don't just have the stories from Snorri. We also have uh, settlements that give us a, in a perspective into um, the way that the Nor people in the Norse period um, conceived of their world. If we take a look at the Trelleborg Fort from Denmark, which was built in the 980s based on dendrochronological dendro chron analysis of the timbers that were used in the construction of it, uh, we can see that we have a circle, we have four points on the sides, uh, and it looks very much like a sort of compass. So there's several different things that we can take from this. Uh, 
you've got a north, south, east, and west door. You've got, if you look carefully, there are four buildings in each quadrant. So you've got 16 buildings in all. It's all based on four. Now, in the 980s, you've got Christianity uh, impacting this area. And the grave patterns from these sites, from forts of this kind that were happening throughout the later 10th century uh, and well into the 11th century, there's about uh, seven of these, and then an eighth one was just recently found. Uh, these seem to show uh, the impact of Christianity, the graves definitely. And then if we consider Christianity uh, with its cruciform pattern, this could very well be a Christian Viking settlement. It's not like there are tons of these kicking around. Even if it's not, it does show us that they're aware of the four compass points, uh, which then maps onto the four seasons and the placement of the sun in those four areas, which are very, very old ideas. They don't necessarily have to be Christian ideas, but it does illustrate, to some degree, the cosmology. To continue on with that, if we take a look at this reconstructed Viking hall that's in Norway, you can see that you have the fire in the center, and then you have these sort of uh, stalls arranged around. And we know from the sagas that in the stalls, where you were positioned around that fire was based on your social standing in society. So where you've got this circular settlement pattern that are at least in some of the Christian settlements, possibly in other settlements as well, you have then a, uh, you have society arranged around a central fire with uh, social standing set up. What we're looking at now is cosmology from the inside. It's not an objectified cosmology, where we're looking at it from the outside and trying to arrange it as an object we can examine, we can hold in our hand almost. And this is what we kind of have to do when we're dealing with cosmology. We have to look at it from the inside. And sometimes modern artists are better at this than scholars. Uh, for, for example, if we take a look at this painting by the, uh, uh, I believe he's a French painter, Alex Alice, uh, he is depicting uh, the uh, serpent Jormungandr, the world serpent, which lives at the bottom of the ocean. His tail is in his mouth. He encircles the entire world. And uh, in the stories, he's blamed for um, massive storms, huge waves, these sorts of things. This is, an, this is a painting that's depicting the cosmology from the inside, the power of it, the strength of it, the terror of it, uh, the glory of it as well. Whereas if you think about the objectified image of the Yggdrasil tree, you're looking at something which is very, um, it's very different from what the Viking experience is. So it's, it's worth bearing that in mind. All right, so let's go through the mythic landscape here, the cosmology. So let's go back to our previous, um, our previous image of the Yggdrasil. And let's just, I want to pick a few things out of this. First of all, what we have here is what's commonly referred to as a world tree. In many different religions, we have this concept of a tree that unites the upper world and the lower world, and we live in the middle of it. It's divided into nine separate realms. And nine as a number is something that is a very, very significant number to, for Norse culture. It comes up again and again and again. And if you, um, if you think about the number nine, it's, you take, it's three sets of three. So you're dealing with a triple triune structure. So if you take a look at this picture of Yggdras with all these different realms around it, that's not actually represented in this image. But it's almost certainly the way uh, people would have been thinking about things in the past, three sets of three. Each of the nine realms also corresponds to a particular order of being. Midgard corresponds to the human experience in our world. Uh, Alfheim is the realm of the elves. Jotunheim is the realm of the, the Jotnur, or the giants. Um, the Svartalfheimr is the, is the dark elves. It's also called um, Nidavetlir, the, the realm of the dwarves. Alsgard is the realm of the Aesir. Vanaheim is the realm of the Vanir. Each being or mode of being has its own realm. Muspelheimer, for example, is a realm of fire and destruction. Niflheimer is a realm of ice and, um, and mist. And then hell is the realm of the dead. So these, you have all these different order of, orders of place which correspond to orders of being. And all of them meet in the middle at Midgarthur. Now this is where I like to sort of leave behind this objectified viewpoint and look at things more from the middle. So if we take a look at the whole of experience or reality, 
uh, we can consider all of experiential reality being comprised of extremes. We can see that you've got height uh, with its corresponding opposite depth, heat with its corresponding opposite of cold. And in the middle of these things, you get extreme cold and extreme heat. And in the middle, you've got where we can live. You've got that which is very, very high, that which is very, very low, and in the middle where we can live. And just similarly, you've got extreme weight, extreme lightness, and in the middle is where we live. And so the Midgarth is actually the middle, the realm of middles. A lot of times people think of it as the middle yard. In other words, everything else, we're in the middle and everything surrounds us. But you can invert that and think of it as it is the realm where you've got all medians. You don't have extremes playing out. Now, when you, you can see this idea playing out in Snorri's account because Midgarth, uh, the sort of realm where we are, is formed in a yawning void called Ginnungagap. And Ginnungagap uh, is in between the two realms of Muspelsheimer and Niflheimer. Niflheimer being cold mist and Muspelsheimer being uh, force and heat. It's the realm of fire. And that in the Gunungagap, what you have is uh, you have the world being formed out of the body of a dead giant, which is the first sort of being. And this is very important because the giants represent the geotectonic forces of the world. In a similar way, hell is the realm of the dead is considered down in the deep, dark depths, down in the, the deepest places. Whereas Alfgarth is almost always conceded as being up high in a lofty place. Now, this isn't a perfect analogy. Alfgarth isn't necessarily always high, and there's places that are higher than Alfgarth. But it's as a general schema, it, it works. Now, alongside and sort of out with these different realms and extremes, you've got these other orders of being, the, the, the elves. You've got the... Um, You've got the dwarves in Niederwetter, which are sometimes, they seem to be the same as the, the dark elves. Uh, they're associated with, um, whereas the elves are associated with natural forces and processes, the dwarves are associated with the formation of uh, natural things such as gold and jewels and all this kind of stuff. Now alongside the Aesir, living in Ausgarth, uh, you have the Vanir. Now these are very similar to the Aesir. In other words, they're they are gods, but they are different from the Aesir. The Aesir can be conceived of as representing those forces that are conducive and uh, constructive for society, whereas the Vanir tend to be more like um, sex, death, and magic. Uh, we can get more into that next time. Now the Jotnar, the giants. These are very similar to the gods in that they're extraordinarily powerful, but they aren't to be considered the, the sort of popular giants, which are sort of big, gigantic, dumb brutes that you see in, like, for example, Jack the Giant Slayer and uh, Harry Potter and whatnot. The giants are actually an order of beings that can be small, they can be large, they can look like, they can look like us. They simply represent the geotectonic forces of nature, uh, which can only properly be... Uh, interacted with through uh, an ability to see past appearances. This is why you often get uh, in folk tales giants being killed, and then their bones become their bones become the rocks, or they turn you know trolls turn into stone uh, in the daytime. That's because these beings are identical with the landscape; they are formative of the landscape. So when we look at the nine realms as they are deployed by uh, Snorri Sturluson, what we're looking at here is a map of all the different orders of being that then come into and form uh, all that is. They inform our experience. They inform our lives, the narratives that we tell. Uh, Midgard is that which holds and and... and underpins our experience. It's the stage on which everything plays out. But when you look at Jotunheimer and Alfheimer and Niederwetter, these are all those different forces around us that we either see or don't see that then cause the phenomena that interacts with us. 
the realms of the Aesir and the Vanir are the realms of those abstract forces that, that come at us from the outside, just as Hell represents the land of the dead, and Muspelheimer represents the land of extreme heat and destruction, and Niflheimer the land of mist and cold. So what we have here is this map of being itself that then uh, contributes individual uh, elements to the whole. And from that, we're going to go on to the gods and the goddesses and their na nature uh, in our next presentation.